Okay, we've been having quite a discussion here at this Bible study at the Gould's house and um, kind of leading into some of the things we're talking about here. If you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Actually, so we're going to have 1 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 1, and Romans 1. And no, we're not going to show the way Paul starts each of his books. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to start in the middle of verse 17. First, I'll just start in verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And verse 18 is what I really want to grab here. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of of God. Keep your hand there for a second. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians, actually 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I knew where it was here. Just making sure y'all are paying attention. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Remember one of the, our principles when we study the Bible, especially right, right division. I always ask you to be good Bereans. Two words in particular when you see them. Gospel and baptism. Always ask yourself which gospel is the passage referring to? Or if it's baptism, which baptism is the passage referring to? By the context, always get the context. Now right here in verse 4, the glorious gospel of Christ. Okay, because verse 3 said, but if our gospel be hid, ah, you're good Bereans right away. Okay, which gospel is he talking about? Keep reading. It is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay, so it's the, it's the, the gospel of Christ in this passage. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that verse 18 again. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but Unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. What's the power of God? The preaching of the cross. Come, keep your hand here again and go to Romans chapter 1 now. Romans chapter 1. So we have Genesis to Malachi, the Old Testament. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the birth of Christ, the crucifixion. The book of Acts picks up. We have Romans to Philemon that come next in your, in your Bible. Romans, the first book written by Paul that shows up in your Bible. Okay, then we have Hebrews through Revelation at the end. So the first book that shows up, written by Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, right here in chapter 1 of Romans, verse 15, Paul says, So, as much as, is, as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Being good Bereans, you ask yourself right there in verse 15, Ah, the gospel, which gospel? Let's keep reading, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, there you go. Clearly, we're talking about the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Wow, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18 said, But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. What was the power of God there? The preaching of the cross. Wow, so the preaching of the cross, the gospel of Christ, virtually synonymous. Well, what is the gospel of Christ? It is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, how that Christ died 
for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, how, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and raised again the third day for our justification, Romans 4, the end of Romans 4 there. Romans 5, 1, as we were talking about here before we turned the camera on, because he was, so he died for our sins, was buried, raised again for our justification, Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And we were talking about some um, horrific situations. We were talking about um, kids in their 20s that have been killed recently in different accidents, whatever it might be. We talked about some other friends that, that anyway, just different people losing children. Um, but the being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, talking about this event right here, the, the calling out of the body of Christ. Um, actually, let's, let's go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians I'm sorry, I said 1 Corinthians. I do mean 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now the passage will be that right there, the end of the dispensation of the grace of God in which we live. But verse 18 says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, whatever we're about to read should be comforting to us. And in times of death now... You know, we miss those around us if, if we lose somebody close to us, a parent, a child, um, a friend. We're in the flesh, we miss them. That's natural. But, verse 18 says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, let's back up to verse 13 and read what should be comforting in a situation like this. And he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, in verse 13, concerning them which are asleep. And asleep, of course, when Paul uses that term, those are people dead in Christ, people that have died with a testimony, people where we know that they've told us uh, that there is a, a day in time, a moment in time, where they, having seen themselves as a lost sinner doomed for hell, finally realized that there was nothing they could do to get good enough, to dress this flesh up, and based on that, they just stopped trying to get good enough and just started trusting in the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ who died for our sins, took those sins to hell, and was raised again for our justification. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So those are the people that are asleep here in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Right here at this event. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. So right here, he descends from heaven. Uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the dead in Christ rise first. Well, what happens next? Then, verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, Comfort one another with these words. Well, there you go. That's the comfort to know. That those, you know, should we lose a child, should we lose a parent, when we know of their test, we, we can be comforted to know that when that day comes, whether we're still here alive on this earth or we pass on and go to sleep in Christ, we're all waiting for that. That's the next event in prophecy. The dead in Christ shall rise. You know, the Lord shall descend from heaven. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then those that are alive and remain until that day will meet those people in the clouds, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And we're just talking about how when we have funerals where we know, um, we, especially when we know that we know, it can be very comforting. Sometimes we don't always know real well. Maybe it's not, not maybe, it's not as comforting, but if there's at least maybe the possibility of a um, testimony of salvation, we're just always going to, I would encourage each of you to always lay hope on that, that that is what that the person did have a day. Where it is um, hard to find that comfort, hard to find that peace is when you know that that person was wrapped up in something that absolutely was contrary to the gospel of Christ. Those are the ones that are tough. Um, when it's contrary to. So, going back to the verses that we, lit, uh, that we read already, you know, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. How in the world does that happen in this day? And those are some of the things I want to talk to you about today. You know, we just, there, there's this movie that's been out for a while. We've been wanting to watch it. You know, I've heard a lot about it. And the name of it is slipping me right now, which is called West Lawn. And in particular, it's about Alabama football back in the, um, in the 70s and, and black, back around integration. Tony Nathan being the, the running back that, uh, the, really the first uh, black running back that uh, Coach Bryant brought into the Alabama football program. And anyway, so it's a quote, religious-based movie. And it's all about how at the high school, while Tony Nathan was there, um, Rudy from Notre Dame football, that Rudy, the guy that played Rudy in the movie, um, comes as a Campus Crusade for Christ type of evangelist or, or something along those lines. And, you know, hey coach, will you let me talk to your team? And, and so he's talking Jesus. No question, he's talking Jesus. And the coach is just like a, and, and they, they very much lead you to believe at the beginning of the movie, the coach is just doesn't want anything to do with religion at all, with church, with Jesus. Um, and, all this, and, and so this evangelist, I'm going to call him loosely, is addressing the team. And of course, most people today, maybe if you're watching this on video sometime and you're going, Steve, where are you going with this? Would think this is just great. You know, one of these great religious Christian movies that just came out where it's a good, wholesome family movie. And it is a good, wholesome family movie. But boy, how does the God of this world blind them? It's movies like this. Flat out, it's movies like this. Because at some point when the whole team is getting all religious, the coach decides, well, man, I guess I better be part of this. So he goes marching into the back. Um, now, the church he walks into is all black. And, and he walks in and, and he says, I want to be baptized. Great, and everybody, hallelujah, and, you know, come on down here, brother, and no, nothing else other than that, other than, I want to be, I, I no, let me back up, because first he goes, I don't know what's going on with my team, all I know is, is they're in there talking this and that, and all I know is I want to be baptized. Wow. Now, half of America right now would be saying, hey, praise the Lord, raising her hand right with them, right? in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. What's the, the power of God unto salvation? It's the gospel of Christ. Romans 1.16, 1 Corinthians 1, as we read. That's the gospel of Christ. That's the power of God unto salvation. The gospel of Christ. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures and was raised again for our justification. That's the gospel of Christ. That's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Period. Nothing more to that. 
Okay, so why are you making a big deal about this? Because now we have another movie that comes on and here's baptism being the power of God unto salvation. That's why it's a damnable doctrine. You're going, wow, that's, those are pretty harsh words. Yeah, I'm, I, the more I teach and teach Bible studies, get involved in, in other Bible studies, the more I believe that. I can remember many times maybe being just like you if you're watching this going, you know, Brother Jerry, Brother E.C., why are you getting so down on, you know, people want to believe that as long as they believe the gospel of Christ, they can be saved. Yeah, but the God of this world is using all these other things to keep the gospel hid and that's why we're talking about it in this study today. Galatians chapter 1. How about that? We're staying in a lot of chapter 1's today of Paul's books. Galatians chapter 1. You know, this is the first book that Paul wrote that became Scripture. Not the first one listed, but the very first one that he wrote that became Scripture. He wrote this probably in Acts chapter 16. Acts 13 is the first time you see the gospel of Christ preached. So here's the first book he writes, and every, every place he went, when he'd leave town, the Jews would come right behind him and try to put everybody under the law, try to put everybody under circumcision. I would subscribe to, to you that today, baptism is equivalent to the religious world the way circumcision was back in Paul's day. Everybody was trying to put them under circumcision back then. Today, everybody's trying to put everybody under baptism as if that has anything to do with your salvation. And then we have many people that will say, no, it's just an outward sign of an inward faith. Yeah, but I've been in many of those churches um, from time to time, and, and I can remember very distinctly being a Baptist church and Southern Baptist church and the person, the people sitting next to us, we didn't know them before we walked in. It was just an open pew, open seats. We went in and sat there and turns out they're going to have a baptism that day um, of an elderly man. And the guys beside, I mean, I mean, we're talking men in their 70s and 80s. I don't really remember. And, and they're literally in tears. Praise the Lord, we've been praying for him for 32 years and he's finally getting baptized. No word of when he trusted. Keep Galatians 1. Actually, the book to your right is Ephesians. Let's go to chapter 1 of Ephesians, but we are coming back to Galatians 1. Ephesians chapter 1 lays this sequence of events out very clearly. Sequence of events as in salvation. The end of verse 12 of Ephesians 1 says, who first trusted in Christ. And I want to grab that phrase as the subject here, trusting in Christ. And please stay with me to the end of the uh, uh, study here. Don't leave if, if I've offended you. If I've rattled your cage, good. I'm not trying to offend you. I am trying to rattle your cage. I want you to see by the scriptures, okay? Please, 20 more minutes. Just listen to what the Word of God says. All we're doing is reading scriptures. Verse 13, after saying, trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after. So when did you trust? After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You just heard the gospel of Christ preached. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That's it right there in one verse. You hear the, the, the gospel. Let me get right to it here. It says, after that you heard the word of truth, okay, you heard the word of truth preached. What's the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. What's that gospel? How that? Christ died for your sins according to scriptures, was buried and raised again for your justification. It didn't say here, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. It said, no, trust in that, that alone. Not only are you saved, but you're sealed unto the, and, and if you want to know how long you're sealed, Ephesians 4.30 would tell you, until the day of redemption. The day of redemption, it's right there. Peter calls it the same thing. It's the day of redemption. That's when the Peter, the, the, Peter, the people that Peter preached to, 
That's when their sins are blotted out. Just look at Acts 3, 19, 20, 21. He tells them exactly. That day of redemption is when their sins are blotted out. Paul tells us that we are sealed, that we today, the church which is the body of Christ, different church than what Peter was setting up back here, it was the kingdom church. Yeah, they were setting up the kingdom. They thought they were going into this period to go into that period. The seven-year period of great tribulation ends with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth to set up his earthly kingdom for a thousand-year reign. So that's Ephesians 1.13. That's today. That's the sequence of events. It's a very deliberate order of events. Now, let's go back to Galatians 1 now. The very first book that Paul writes that becomes Scripture. And the first five verses are pretty much an introduction. Then verse 6. I mean, you can even see, we'll start in verse 5. And watch what the first thing that Paul really nails us with in verse 6. So verse 5, he says, To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so he... Very clear, he ends his introduction. Now what does he say first of all? He goes, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Remember, always ask yourself, which gospel? So when Paul says this, he, and he says, now they're calling into you another gospel, and you're going to follow another gospel. Well, what is that other gospel? Verse 7, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Well, it's a perversion of the gospel of Christ. That means changing it. That means adding something to it or taking something away. So if you try to add any works to it, that's perverting the gospel of Christ. If you try to add circumcision to it, which is what they do in here in the next few verses and chapters, that's perverting the gospel of Christ. If you add water baptism to it, that's perverting the gospel of Christ. Where water baptism is affiliated with gospels, and it is absolutely affiliated with other gospels in your Bible. It is required for salvation. It's not. Nowhere in your Bible is it an outward sign of an inward faith. It's part of salvation, just not in the year 2016, which is in the dispensation of the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us there's one baptism, so once again I ask you, figure it out by Scripture, which baptism is it? I would subscribe to you, it is the baptism by the Spirit at the moment that you trust in Christ for your salvation. You are baptized by the Spirit, there's one baptism and that's it. Everything else is a perversion of the gospel of Christ. Verse 7, now verse 8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, or the next new pope that comes along, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And in case you miss it, as we said before in verse 9, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, which by the passage in verse 7, it's the gospel of Christ, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Just let the words say what they say. Verse 11. Yeah, but, you know, Steve, you're saying, well, let's come down and read verse 11. Lest I get in the way of what Paul said very clearly. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, and I would say, ask you, which gospel is that? Again, it's verse 7, the gospel of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What was that other movie we watched not long ago that had Peter and Paul all buddy-buddied and... and um, yeah, risen, and, and you just go, wow. It's like they had Paul right there at the cross, and it's what they lead you to believe. Once again, how does the God of this world do it? Here's the last two movies we've watched in the last two months, Risen being the other one. Oh, it's got to be a great movie, right? It's about the resurrection of Christ. It is, sat it is Satan behind it, let me say it that way. It is Satan using those people in Hollywood to blind the minds of them that believe not. That's what's going on today. Left and right, it's what's going on. 
and and why you know Steve you're getting mad yeah because I, I've had too many funerals that I've had to go to in the last weeks and months maybe some coming up and and you just you, you get you get mad at religion that that causes people to believe all these false doctrines all these perversions of the gospel of Christ. Let's just call it that. They're perversions of the gospel of Christ, as Paul warned us about in the very first book he wrote, in the very first chapter of the very first book he wrote, first subject out of the chute, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. And most people today will use the term grace of Christ and and okay, dispensation of grace, whatever that is, yeah, maybe we're there, maybe we're not. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 3 is clear. We are in the dispensation of the grace of God. It has, it's always been, faith has always been part of salvation since Genesis. It will be clear to the end of Revelation. But until the book of Romans, it's faith and works all through here. What happened when Christ was on earth and that rich young ruler comes up to him and says, good master, what good thing should I do that I may have eternal life? Wow, if somebody's going to ask the Lord Jesus Christ himself while he's on earth, Matthew, in the book of Matthew, and, and says, what should I do to have eternal life? Do you think you ought to pay attention? Absolutely, if you were alive then. First thing Christ said back to the man was, keep the law. Can you keep the law today and, and have eternal life? No, we're in a different dispensation. It was faith and works. In the book of Acts, first seven chapters, it was faith and works. Out here in the trib, you better believe it's faith and works. And here in the dispensation of God, it's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, next few words, not of works. Pretty clear. Oh yeah, there's another phrase after that. Lest any man should boast. What do people want to do when they're telling you, they're trying to tell you how good they are? Well, I don't this and I don't chew and I don't dip and I don't drink and, and I go to church every Sunday. They want to boast. Is it a good idea not to dip? Sure. You get skin cancer in your mouth if you don't. It's a good idea not to smoke? Sure. A lot of lung cancer caused by that. Hurts people around you. Does it have anything to do with your salvation whether you do or don't? No. You know, it's, it's just the things that, that people make up to try to put us into bondage and that's what Paul uses that term many times in this book of Galatians. You know, today you know, many of us in this room have studied for decades what we term right division. And by the way, I brought some, a bunch of these um, that Richard Jordan's uh, place puts out, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. It has this timeline, you know, the way most, like, like Dallas Theological Seminary, or, or the way, if we look at it like this, this would be how Peter and the Twelve thought the Bible was unfolding. When I say thought, to them it was unfolding this way. Until you get to Acts 7, this is how it was unfolding. After the resurrection of Christ, Peter and the twelve get on with it, and they think they're walking right into that seven-year period of great tribulation. And had the Jews believed, like at Acts 7, had they believed, you know, why did Stephen say, Lord, forgive them, they know not what they do, um, it's not what, how he said it. Acts chapter 7. Maybe it is how he said it. I'm sorry, I've got two things going on in my mind right now. I, I don't want to misquote, so I want to go there and grab it. And he said, Lord, yeah, this is it. Lord, lay not this into their charge. That's what he said. Lord, lay not this into their charge, the, the stoning of Stephen. All right? This sin, the blasphemy, of the Holy Ghost. They were blaspheming and at that time blasphemy was still at the point where it could be forgiven neither in this world nor in the world to come. That's why something had to change for the Apostle Paul to be saved because he blasphemed right here in Acts 7. He's a ringleader. 
But then this dispensation of the grace of God enters in. It's a mystery. And it unfolds like this. And that period that we live in today, the dispensation of the grace of God. So if you'd like to have one of these, just go to the contact us part of the website and just uh, send us your, your address. We'll send you one of these. It's a great study guide to have with you. And of course, those of you in the study, you see there's a lot of them here. All of these are staying here um, for you. Take as many and give them out. Okay, why I'm bringing that up. There are many that have studied with us in right division, in we call it the grace movement. Um, um, the studies, you know, Brother E.C. Moore, Brother Jerry Lockhart, Steve Atwood, um, Mark Rumfellow, many other, Obed Kirkpatrick. Um, something that has pulled some away is this period, this period of tribulation, and is the church going to go into it? And let's, let's go to Revelations chapter 13. Let's just, again, look at what saith the Scripture. Revelation 13. So first of all, we will not be here. Okay, we already read 1 Thessalonians 4. I'm, I'm suggesting to you that I believe that the Bible's clear that the dispensation of the grace of God will end with the event there at 1 Thessalonians 4, the calling out, the raptures, as it's called, of the body of Christ. Then begins the seven-year period of great tribulation. Then the doctrine goes to Hebrews through Revelation. Okay, so it's Romans, the Philemon, those 13 books written by the Apostle Paul, the 13 most forgotten books in your Bible, it seems. And then it goes to Hebrews through Revelation, which also just happens to match doctrine back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, the Gospel of the Kingdom being preached back here. Actually, let's, let's keep your hand here in Romans 13, uh, Revelation 13, excuse me. Go back to Matthew chapter 24, the Gospel of the Kingdom. Very clear that this is the Gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ taught the Twelve. And, you, and you'll see Gospel of the Kingdom, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, and we're going to read it right here in chapter 24, verse 14 says, so in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom, always ask yourself, which gospel? Gospel of the kingdom, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, two things while we're here. First of all, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Well, how about the verse before? But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And throughout this book of Matthew, you'll see two phrases. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The kingdom, there it is, right out there is where that kingdom will be. He that shall endure to the end, yeah, to the end of the trib. How do you know it's the trib? Verse 15, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. On and on he goes. He's talking about the pro all the prophecies about right here. Daniel, Joel, uh, Peter, when he first, the first time he preaches, Acts chapter 2, around verse 17, 18. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. This period. Daniel chapter 9. This. Isaiah, Jeremiah, all talking about and prophesying about this period. The Lord Jesus Christ right here, talking about right there, when the abomination of desolation shall stand. Uh, come down, verse uh, 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days, what days the period of great tribulation should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Okay, he's talking about right there. Uh, come to verse um, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. 
and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes in the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, and on and on. He's right there at the end of the trib. There's your second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth to set up his thousand-year reign. Now, many people are trying to tell you today the church is going to go through the trib, the church which is the body of Christ. No, it can't. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And we start in verse 11. And of course, Revelation is talking about this period out here. And no, we don't even study it that often, but it's, it's applicable today, what we're talking about. Verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. That's right. In the trib, in the middle of the trib there, that, that man, that, uh, the son of perdition, he's killed and three days later, wow, he's raised again. And everybody's going to think he's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's raised from the dead. And let's keep reading here. Verse 13, And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them. There's that word deceive again. How many times does Paul use that? I, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 is becoming my verse of all verses. And I fear, Paul says, and I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And he goes on and on with the word deception. Verse 14, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them, first of all, right there, by the means of those miracles. How many other, quote, Christian movies do we have coming out here in the last year that have to do with all these miracles, people getting healed, little eight-year-old boys that die and go to heaven and come back and tell us what heaven looks like and, and little girls that fall out of trees and, and the miracles that heal them as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. These are the things that, are, that, are, that the God of this world is using to blind the minds of them which believe not less the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them and that they should be saved. Yeah, I worry about the little things like that because the things closest to the truth are the things that we have to fear the most. Let's keep reading here. Um, and by the means of, verse 14 in the middle, by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. There you go again. He had the wound, but he did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Whoa, should be killed? Those people that wouldn't worship him will be killed. So we're out here in the trib. We're in the middle of the trib now, the abomination of desolation. Worship the image of that beast. They're being told by that Antichrist. Those that aren't are killed. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might, you know, so why are they doing that? Verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. They cannot conduct trade. You cannot buy food for your family without the mark of the beast. That's what's going to be going on right here. By the way, that's exactly why Peter back here in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5 talked about selling out and having all things common because he thinks he's starting there at the beginning years of this seven-year period of great tribulation 
as he says, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel, Daniel, 70th week of Daniel, the only way they'd make it through is to sell out, have all things common, so they don't have to take the mark of the beast. Because if they do, if they do, come ahead. Verse, um, so let's go to chapter 14 now. Uh, we'll start in verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and to kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. I mean, it is right there. They're about to walk into it. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea, and the fountains of water. Now this is the everlasting gospel. Which gospel? The everlasting gospel. Fear God and give glory to Him. Now, verse 8. And there followed another angel, not the one preaching the everlasting gospel. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, pretty clear who we're talking about here, verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Those people did not have eternal security. They could not have been saved by the same gospel you and I are saved by today, the gospel of Christ. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures and for our justification. Out there, it's fear God, the everlasting, it's, a, it's the gospel of the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Take the mark of the beast is not enduring to the end. The second you did that, the second those people do that in the future, when that period is in existence, they're done. They blasphemed they're done, according to what we just read right here. Therefore, how could any of us in this room, how could anybody <clears throat> walk in this earth today that's saved by the gospel of Christ go into the trib and that be the case? It, it can't be. It can't be. They take the mark. They're done. And if you don't believe it, look at the example in Acts chapter 5. Their names are Ananias and Sapphira. When they hold back, they do sell like they're supposed to. They hold back just a part of it. And Peter says, what has caused thee to lie to the Holy Ghost? And they're struck dead right there on the spot. They did not have eternal security. Eternal security did not exist in the gospel of the kingdom. It does not exist out here. They have to endure to the end, exactly as the gospel of the kingdom says. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24, 13. Let the words say what they say. So people, people, the God of this world is using so many other things. Go to 2 Corinthians 11. So many other things to blind the minds of them that believe not. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious image of God, unless the, 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 the... I'm going to read it so I'm not misquoting. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 is that verse we, I talked about earlier. But I fear, lest by any means, 
like any of these movies we're talking about today. By the, by the way, the other thing that's going, well, let's read the verse. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Remember we started out, one of the verses was Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I was assuming you had a King James Version in your hand, because if you have any other version you're reading from, it did not say gospel of Christ in verse 16. Isn't that something? The first time the, gospel of, the term gospel of Christ shows up in your Bible. And all other perversions of the word of God, remember, which is not another gospel, but a those that would pervert the gospel of Christ. It's exactly what all the other perversions of the word of God do. They pervert the word. They change the word. They leave out of Christ. I was in a Bible study last Tuesday. We were reading Romans chapter 1. And the, the man that was reading was reading out of NIV. And, of course, it was just the gospel. You know, verse 15, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you. Verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I asked him, you know, would you read yours? I knew this guy had the um, ESV, English Standard Version. No, it's just the gospel. Another guy had ASV or NASB, just the gospel. NIV, the gospel. So that's funny. Gospel or, or King James has, it's the gospel of Christ. And we were able to spend another 20 minutes on different gospels. A Catholic guy sitting right next to me, and he goes, what do you mean other gospels? And... So we were able to talk about gospel of the kingdom, gospel of Christ, gospel of the circumcision, gospel of the uncircumcision, everlasting gospel, um, and then the fact that there's many others as well. We can let the word of God show, but isn't it something that all others leave out the term gospel of Christ the very first time it's used in your Bible? The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Wow. While we're in 2 Corinthians 11, we read verse 3. Steve, you're down on religion. Yep, it's right here in verses 13, 14, 15. For such are false apostles. Oh, you're talking about like out here that... that, that Beast, in the image of the beast, right? I don't know. Let's keep reading. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. There's that word marvel again, like Paul used in Galatians chapter 1. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Verse 14 here, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also, whose ministers? Satan's ministers also, be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. There you go. You don't need me to tell you what those words say. They're pretty doggone clear. And you can see those transformations every Sunday morning if you just turn on the television and watch men that call themselves preachers of the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second, we are in 2 Corinthians right here, chapter 4. We started out, second passage we read was verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Steve, you're beating that into us. You know what? Let's go back and read verses 1 and 2. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, there's that word again, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Using verse 2 is the way he does that. 
handling the Word of God deceitfully. Yeah, I get real upset. Just like Brother Moore did, just like Brother Jerry did, and I am finally getting it because I guess I'm seeing it enough now firsthand. And I've seen too many people deceived. I could not believe at a funeral I was at not long ago and just watching some of the absolute... Uh, I don't even know what the word is. Not just deception, but how, how do people believe that stuff? I, I just don't get it. I do not get it. They obviously have never opened up... The, they obviously don't open up this Bible very often. I'll say it that way. What goes on, it, it's 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15, and all of the sheep today that think that just because some man puts a robe on, that he's got some special grace from God or something to lead them somewhere, and he is leading them somewhere, and it's not where a place where you want to go. Read the book. See what the book says. It's the Word of God. Why, did, why, do we make, why do we make such a big deal about 2 Timothy 2.15? Study is the first word. Study. That's a good place to start. That's an action word. Study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. There's not a one of you that's gotten this far in the tape that doesn't want to be approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what explains all the things that if we're really studying, things that seem like they might be contradictions in the Bible, they're not. There's different rules, there's different guidelines for different dispensations throughout the Bible. Just as this dispensation, the easiest dispensation, by the way, in which to live, the dispensation of the grace of God. It's right there in Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 10. Revealed to Paul, or Paul makes man as it is now made manifest. Wow. The next dispensation, the seven-year period of great tribulation. You don't want to be there. By the way, if, you, if you're seeing this and you're there, you'll have no hope. You will believe that lie. The Bible says you will in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's why we want to make sure we share the gospel of Christ with everybody so they, they get saved. They're out of here when that period happens. But it's, it's, it's this 2 Corinthians 11. It's verses 13 to 15. It is the ministers of Satan transforming themselves into ministers of righteousness. Those are the people leading the charge. Sometimes that's in pulpits on Sunday mornings. Sometimes that takes the form of men out there in, in Hollywood that create these films, and especially the Christian films. Satan's all over it. You know, Steve, you, you get wound up sometimes. You know, the deception, deception. You know, it's one thing to see it in politics, but it's another thing, thing to see it with, with this book. And men that do it with this book, as we read here, chapter four, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. What are those? Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. I can't think of a worse sin there's such a thing, than handling the Word of God deceitfully, especially from a pulpit. Deceitfully. To me, that's knowingly, that's willingly, deliberately leading somebody astray. To deceive somebody means to get them to believe something is true when they know it's false, or to get them to believe something is false when they really know it's true. That's deception, and it's knowingly and it's willingly, and unfortunately it's done way too often, and I don't know who the shame should be on the person doing that, or shame on the person that allows it. Great, great, great line in a movie. Now I'm going to use another movie, Braveheart. 
and Earl the Bruce goes up there near the end of the movie when, when they just got um, Braveheart, um, William Wallace, and now they've got him in captivity. And, and William the Bruce runs up to his father, 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 you deceived me. And the next words to me is Christianity today, you let yourself be deceived. If you do not study this word, you let yourself be deceived. It's shame on you, not shame on the man that's teaching you wrong. Shame on you. You should be like the Bereans in Acts 17. Verse 12 says, Therefore many of them believed. What's the therefore? What's the why for? It's verse 11. They, they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures. How often, team? Daily. Whether those things were so. Do that, and it's awful difficult to be deceived. Don't do that, and it's very easy to be deceived. But there is no excuse out there at the great white throne judgment. Yeah, but he deceived me. You let yourself be deceived. I gave, this is Lord Jesus Christ and, and God the Father. I gave you a Bible. Did you follow 2 Timothy 2.15? Did you study to show yourself approved unto God? When was the day... You know, I know you heard the word, I, I'm obviously putting some words, but, you know, I know you heard the word, the gospel of Christ preached, the gospel of your salvation, how that Christ died for your sins, was buried, took your, do you understand? The Lord Jesus Christ spent three days in hell, suffering the death you deserved. Have you ever really stuff, studied the suffering he went through prior to the cross? Mel Gibson, there's another movie. Mel Gibson sure nailed it in The Passion for the Christ. His passion, the sufferings that you and I deserved to get on that cross. Then our sins were placed on him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he, God, hath made him, Christ, for he hath made him to be sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Are we righteous? No. Do we have God's righteousness accounted unto us? Absolutely. You have the righteousness of God accounted unto you if you have a day of salvation in your life. And if you do have that day, you're sealed unto the day of redemption. That's it. Study to show yourself approved unto God. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Romans 10.13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you have never called upon Him, quit trying to be good enough and just trust the glorious gospel of Christ and you'll be saved. And I thank you for holding out to the end of this tape. Get round.